this is a moment that is going to change this nation. This is a moment that forges character. nothing compared to this. People come in, they get intubated, they die, the cycle repeats. We are New York tough. We are tough. You have to be tough. This place makes you tough. We're going to overcome this, and America will be the greater for it. Times Square, normally a manic mass of people, now almost totally devoid of them. This is a city many of us feel we know, the one that never sleeps. And now look at it. Once again, it is ground zero. This is going to be weeks and weeks and weeks. This is going to be a long day. And it's going to be a hard day. And it's going to be an ugly day. And it's going to be a sad day. This is a rescue mission that you're on. The mission is to save lives. Elmhurst Hospital in Queens the site of an apocalyptic surge in one of New York's poorest neighborhoods. Bleak, long lines of the sick waiting to be tested. A virus already out of control and a country, the most powerful on earth, overwhelmed. America went from just 15 cases of coronavirus in the last week of February to having the world's highest number of deaths, now tens of thousands of people. We saw that disaster unfold on the front line. It was a journey that started in New Rochelle, a suburb of New York, where a synagogue was at the center of an ominous outbreak. For three kids. The National Guard deployed, a containment zone established. But it didn't stop spring breakers, weeks later, flooding Florida's beaches. Now it's the horrifying numbers of the hungry that fill our screens. Millions out of work and in search of a meal. The spectre of a 21st century Great Depression. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic vaccine or therapy. It's just behaviors. Each of our behaviors translating into something that changes the course of this viral pandemic. In the next several days to a week or so, we're going to continue to see things go up. The next week is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment. It's going to be our 9-11 moment. Uh, it's going to be the hardest moment for many Americans in their entire lives. How quick and stark it was. The incongruous site of a field hospital in Central Park, a tourist hotspot now called the Hot Zone. At the start, hospitals couldn't find enough space for the sick. The city still can't find it for the dead. It's hell, biblical. I kid you not. Right, 
303 receive response. We're on shift with Captain AJ Briones in Yonkers. He's a paramedic working seven days a week, and it's non-stop. Everybody calls us the front line, but we're really, we're the last line. Yeah, somebody, somebody who's really sick, you have to get there as quick as you can, but you also want to be safe. You know, the thing that we talk about is we're 911. There is no 912. Three Larry Temple. AJ's team is getting three times the usual number of call-outs because of coronavirus. These days, they're the first and sometimes the only emergency responders that go into people's homes. It's an eerie feeling here. We're waiting outside. He's gone inside to see the patient who's struggling with breathing. You get a real sense of just how much pressure, how much work these paramedics are having to do, often on their own. They're at risk. There's every chance they, too, could get exposed to COVID-19. Back in New York City, we go inside Brooklyn's biggest hospital, an ER that's become a war zone, where there's a constant crush of COVID-19 casualties. We're now in the critical care area of the emergency department. Everyone that's in here today is here due to breathing problems, almost uniformly all from COVID. We're seeing a, such a large increase on a day-to-day -day basis on the number of patients who are presenting in critical condition, requiring really all the resources that we have to provide in order to help them. Dr. Eitan Dickman says there are normally 17 beds in this room at Maimonides Medical Center. Today, there are 32 patients, and the numbers are rising rapidly every hour. This pandemic demands more people, more space, and more staff willing to confront a lot more danger. So we have opened up new ICUs, new intensive care units. We've opened up new medical units in order to accommodate for this increased demand of patients who are coming in so ill. Everywhere in the hospital is now effectively an intensive care unit. And they're seeing every type of person in this ethnically diverse borough. This is an intense, demanding and desperate atmosphere in here. The patients keep coming. And it's not just the elderly, it's the young too. And they're all struggling. It's a daunting new frontier for medics even for the most experienced. We're obviously seeing a large number yeah. of critically ill patients. Yeah, I've seen some of the sickest patients I've ever seen in my whole career. Uh, not only do they have coronavirus, but they also have their diabetes that's out of control. Um, so it's particularly hard and we're learning how to do it. It's a very sharp learning curve and an often brutal experience for those with existing health conditions. Really, the main effect that we're seeing is, it's, is a significant effect on impairing the lung's ability to provide the oxygen that, that the body needs. And then it spreads. It affects the heart. It affects the kidney. Ultimately, unfortunately, oftentimes taking the ultimate toll. Throughout this crisis, there has been a shortage of personal protective equipment. Maimonides was well prepared, but across the city, supplies are on a tightrope. How concerned are you about the days, the weeks and months ahead? I think we're in for a significant period of seeing uh, a lot of very, very ill patients. And this is going to put a strain on the system. Uh, we want to make sure that we have enough supplies, including PPE for the staff, including ventilators, high flow oxygen devices. At this time, we do have sufficient supplies, but that's something that we're monitoring very, very closely. Their work starts on the streets, triage tents at the front for the living, refrigerator trucks at the back to carry the dead. 
But here is where brave doctors and nurses work every minute, risking their lives so others can avoid that fate. America imposed travel restrictions on China pretty quickly. It has now tested more people for COVID-19 than any other country too. But that aggressive screening didn't happen early enough. Regulatory hurdles, technical flaws, and lapses in leadership meant it spread undetected for weeks. President Trump, meanwhile, has gone from skepticism to optimism to sounding the alarm. One person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. Is this just like flu? Because people die from the flu. When you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. Yes. This is a pandemic. I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. But this is going to be a very painful, very, very painful two weeks. We took good care of every place. We didn't, we didn't miss a trick. But could he have seen what was coming? Eric Lipton and a team of journalists at the New York Times claim health officials concluded that it was time to move to social distancing back in the third week of February. But that recommendation wasn't made directly to Mr. Trump then. There was a consensus that was reached among the medical advisors that it was the time had come to, to flip the switch and to go to what's called mitigation, which means social distancing, closing schools, closing businesses, causing intentionally causing economic harm to the United States, which is something that Trump really did not want to do. But the time had come by the third week in February to make that difficult choice because you were going to save potentially a million lives if you did that. And, and Trump was unwilling to do that until March 16th. And that was basically a week or two late for places like New York, Michigan, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, Louisiana, um, places where there are more deaths than there needed to be if, if the United States had switched to mitigation sooner. No, he's going to have to wait. Okay. I'll get that. You talk it home? Yes, we're open. Small groups, yes. If you just give me a call to let me know when you're coming, because we are a little busy, and I want to make sure somebody is here to sit down and speak with you properly. Gerard Neufeld Funeral Home was at the heart of managing the mounting death toll, and it still is. The man, there's just unfortunately a lot of deaths all at the same time. So we're trying to manage services for all the families in a proper way whatever they want to do. So, and it's just a lot of families all at the same time. So we're trying to get fit in schedules, trying to keep track of who's, you know, which day, which family's going to go and go from there. People are unfortunately passing away in, in big numbers and because they live in this area and I'm the only funeral home left in this area, they're coming to me. So, so I'm trying to accommodate them best I can, so. And every day, more and more bodies come. Yes, yes. I mean, we left uh, the office last night, and I think we had about 12 services or so scheduled. And shortly after I left the office, within uh, two hours, I had three more services. And then this morning, as soon as we came in, we put on three or four more services. So um, that's what's happening. And, and it's only 12 o'clock. Robert Lugo has just lost his grandmother. Anna. Her family suddenly robbed of the chance to grieve together. My grandmother died alone. <laughs> that was not my grandma. Like, 
she died alone. But we didn't even get to say bye to her. And I understand that's part of the death process. But she was there, she was in the hospital, she was feet away. We couldn't even see her, we couldn't talk to, talk to her. We couldn't even give her like that boost of morale to say, hey, you know, you're gonna come out of this. Or we need you to come out of this. Like, there was nothing. What would you say to those people who don't think coronavirus is a serious threat? If you don't think that it's a serious threat, here I am. I lost my grandmother in the, in the midst of less than a week. Robert's family had just celebrated her 80th birthday. They call her the glue. Now they too are infected. She was exposed to the virus. They also became exposed to the virus. And half of our family member right now are in quarantine because they tested positive. With collective mourning forbidden and traditional rituals removed, death is marked by a drive-through. The crematories really aren't letting anybody in. The cemeteries are limiting it for the most part to people staying in their cars and just watching the burial from the graveside. Joe negotiates at the gates. Carrying the candles for the families that can't. Sometimes when it's so brief, it, it almost leaves them still feeling hollow, like, you know, what just happened? They don't have enough time to process it. You know, and it, it's heartbreaking. It, it, it's really sad. In these alien times, there is no group goodbye. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Right, right. It's a little after dawn when we witness just how great and grim the scale of the problem is. On this truck, bodies of the dead. This is Heart Island, where coronavirus victims are among those being temporarily buried in mass graves, unclaimed by a family member or unable to afford a private funeral. There are normally 25 caskets a week placed here. Now it's nearly that many every day. In the centre of the city, there are makeshift morgues everywhere. Some places are running out of body bags. The authorities acknowledge the death toll is likely higher than the official figures, but no one knows just how much. This team at Long Island Jewish Medical Centre work in a morgue, processing and examining those killed by coronavirus. I really admire our colleagues on the front lines that are dealing with the patients that are coming in uh, with the COVID-19. They're triaging them, they're managing them, they're treating them. But I think people also need to realize that there's another front to this war, and that's the front with the dead. It's not just the sheer volume of cases that's challenging. They're also trying to find a new way of communicating with relatives. Um, it's always working with hard working with the families at this point in time, but even more so now when, when you know, they're not able to see their loved ones in their last moments. They've had to improvise to try and support the bereaved, offering them a chance to see those they've lost using video calls. This time it was a FaceTime, so I did first let her see me explain, you know, what she's going to see, 
asking her if it's okay that she's, you know, are you able to see this? You know, because we couldn't keep it the way we normally do as far as, you know, having sheets and it was a body bag and you're seeing her face. So that was difficult. It must be very surreal and distressing for a family to have to look at their loved one on FaceTime. I'm not going to lie, I cried. It was tough. But, yes. You know, it's if we could do at least one small thing to make this hard time for them a little bit easier, that's what we're going to do. And no matter how crazy our day is and how much work we have to get done, we're going to do our best for our families that we're dealing with their, their family. Carrying out lots of post-mortems will be crucial to understanding the virus and ultimately saving lives. Lisa normally deals with all the administrative issues, but there are so many bodies, she now has to help move them too. The three of us were outside and we just collapsed on like a crate and we were just done. You know, we're exhausted. We're physically exhausted. We're mentally exhausted. They expanded their morgue. Others haven't been able to. It is a structure that simply wasn't built for this level of strain. Across America, what we can now see is that certain groups are disproportionately affected. In Louisiana, 70% of those who have died are African Americans, yet they represent only 32% of the population. In the Lower Ninth Ward, destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, they're bracing for another disaster. Anita's mother, Mary, has fluid on her lungs, but she took her out of hospital, fearful she might also get coronavirus. To make sure she don't die from it. Because another thing, you know, your, your, your people dying from it and, and, and they're alone. They're alone. Who want to go out like that? You can't have a proper barrier for them, you know, and it's, and it, and it's sad. So we just said we'll stay here with mom until all this pass over. It's quite a risk you took. Right, it's very risky for her and for us just as well because it's a monster. We can't even see it, but we know it's, it's here. So basically that's all we've been doing, keep the house bleached clean everything so we can have more time with my mom. She's 75 years old. How scared are you for your mom? Well, I'm scared to death. Like she come out and catch a little fresh air, but I I let her catch a little fresh air because she still have to live. She can't stand there day in, day out, day in, day out. Come catch a little fresh air and then we go back in. Black people are more likely to suffer comorbidities, two diseases, like obesity and diabetes. They also work in riskier front-facing service jobs. Those factors have played a huge role in this pandemic. It's the perfect storm of problems here. Poverty, poor access to healthcare and poor health. When you speak to people, they'll also tell you that this is a place of big families who live close together and love to hug. That has been a hard thing to shake. The famous Mardi Gras is too. City officials pressed ahead with it in late February, a heaving mass of people on the streets. Two months later, New Orleans had the highest death rate in America. But that was long before a national emergency was declared. Jesus, 
this is long after an Easter Sunday service in Baton Rouge. that all men are created equal and are endowed with, with rights from their creator. Certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this freedom that I have does not come from my governor. It comes from my God. For my God A fierce, uncompromising show of American individualism. This morning we had 1,425 people in attendance. People came here from 20 different states this morning to worship with us. The reason being is people have deep convictions about going to church, especially on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is the greatest Christian holiday of the year because we celebrate our resurrected Savior. Every church's doors are shuttered in America. As you know, worshiping God behind a screen on a television is not the same as worshiping God in person. What do you say to those people that accuse you of being irresponsible, putting lives at risk? I say to them, don't be an hypocrite. Anybody that's on that road right now, anybody that's in a retail store such as Walmart, such as a liquor store, if you go to those places but will not come to church, you're two-faced, you're a hypocrite. It is hard to comprehend when you hear stories like this one. The Franklins lost four members of their family in just 12 days. Every other bed was one of the family members, four family members in the same ICU at the same time. It was first my uncle passed, then a few days later my grandmother passed, and a few days later my dad passed, and a few days later after that my other uncle passed. You've dealt with so much loss in such a short space of time. How are you coping? The whole virus is just unbelievable. And what's the hardest for me is some people really think that it doesn't exist and it's not real. And we've buried four family members. We've buried my, my husband and two of his brothers in the same funeral, three caskets in a row. And it, I just want the world to know that this is real. Do you think that Poverty to some extent in New Orleans and Louisiana as well has played a role. People fearing they won't have enough money to go to the doctors. I think health conditions has a, a, a huge part of it in some cases. But people in New Orleans are very culturally superstitious. People don't like hospitals here. You have to be really sick to go to a hospital in New Orleans. Yeah. Like I said, my, my dad's fiance forced him to go. Especially African-American families. Mm -hmm. we, 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 and we have big stigmas about hospitals. Local author Maurice Ruffin sees a past and present marked by disadvantage. Why do you think Louisiana is suffering as much as it is? Well, I think that part of it is economic disparity. The South does tend to have less money than the northern part of the country. Uh, here in Louisiana, in particular, there's this legacy of systemic racism that has been born forth to the present. And that means that a lot of African Americans in this city and in this state don't have good economic opportunities to get education or health care. And those things have played forward throughout this entire uh, pandemic. The homeless in the city have lost their shelters and soup kitchens. Some only just lost their homes after losing their jobs. Now they stand six feet apart, hoping to get food. And that hunger, that insecurity, is everywhere. Just look at this. San Diego and a seemingly endless line of cars wait for a meal. With more than 22 million unemployed, the desperation dwarfs anything in recent history. The 
The food bank Feeding America has seen a 40% increase in demand. It expects a shortfall of $1.4 billion. The government has tried to ease the financial pain, sending $1,200 checks to Americans as part of an historic stimulus package. Early evidence suggests most of it is being spent on food. There will likely be a tale of two pandemics in America that emerges in the next few months. One about those who were scared, disrupted, but thanks to luck and advantage, they will survive physically, emotionally, financially. There are the others, though, who will be left with deep scars. This crisis will change the course of their lives. New Orleans is a city divided by the haves and have-nots. It is now being stalked by a virus. Once again, the poorest people are carrying the heaviest burden. Unlike some countries, America has no experience of such a testing public health emergency. In a cramped New York, hospitals are so full, they're ferrying patients around in groups in a vehicle normally used for mass casualties. Nothing? Can you get her last name? What have the last couple of days been like for you? It's been like a long time for me. Can we breathe in? No, we need to. What about nausea? Any nausea or vomiting? Any nausea or vomiting? The United States is a global leader in science, technology and medicine, but it wasn't prepared for a pandemic. No one really was. And it has never had to collectively sacrifice quite like this. In just one week, the world's superpower was asking nurses to make their own gowns and masks. Inside St. Joseph's Medical Center in Yonkers, they're still processing it. I always trusted our government to be able to provide the stuff we need. I'm sorry, you know? And then when you hear the difference in the government and, and people speaking for the government, it doesn't make sense. We need nursing staff, we need physicians, we need PPEs. America is not Italy, but, you know, it turned out that we were much worse. So it, it's definitely something that we, we, I, we think about and it's, it's hopefully going to change in the future because this, this is unnecessary and just sad at this point. Why do you think America suffered so much? We were unprepared. We were unprepared for this. The decisions made by state governors have been critical some moving quickly, others not moving at all. 
with some high stakes consequences. But there are those who still feel the buck stops with the president. I think he needs to accept his responsibility in this and um, now try to fix it. But don't blame everybody else and all the other people and the other governors and, and mayors and things like that when if early intervention, he, he, I think he could have prevented some of this. You feel let down by Donald Trump? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a... Uh... The administration, like I, like I said, just had no plan for this. So it's uh, it's hard when you are going through this and you're in the midst of it, and there's really no support coming from anywhere except you know this local community. Are you having chest pain? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they want to make sure everything in your lungs are okay. Right. So this is a special kind of film that we're ordering. Okay. to look at it, okay? What is clear inside St. Joseph's is the inherent goodness of this country, the selflessness and the heroism of its people, however politically divided it may be. What are the things that stick in your mind the most? I guess stories, stories of a nurse saying, I had a day off yesterday and tears just kept coming to my eyes. And here she's back again to work through the day. Families being separated from their dying loved ones. I just, I, to me, that's inconceivable. I know that, that, unfortunately, there'll be a lot of people who don't survive this. At least 75% of the people who go on ventilators are not coming off. This team has seen things they couldn't possibly coach their hearts or minds for. How much death have you personally confronted? We've never seen anything like this. Personally, in one 12-hour shift, I pronounced six people dead, just me, and that didn't include the other physicians who had deaths as well. It's a staggering number. It's a staggering number. I've never had anything like that in my entire 20-plus year career. The psychological impact on medical staff will likely be felt and studied for years to come. The hardest moments are when you feel like, um, like you just stretched so thin, where it feels like there's no, there's no way that you could take care of the patients that are here in the way that you're trained to do so. That's really the hardest part, because all of us here, I mean, we went to school, we learned all the, all the things you're supposed to do, on a regular basis and when the capacity is overloaded and you just can't you can't make those things happen it really it, it weighs on you and you know that there are people that are that are going through some serious hard times and possibly their last moments on this earth and you just want to be able to stand there with them and hold their hand and it's impossible this was new to everyone dislocating bewildering it will reshape the country and many families. There are just so many stories of loss and isolation. I've just been told they had a wife and husband, a sister and brother. They came in together. They had to place them apart and they all died alone. Mm. And yet, some states are already starting to reopen. USA! 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 The fact is, America is a decentralized country that champions individual liberties. Protests in Texas, Michigan, and Minnesota show people are impatient to get back to normal life. Others want to keep the brakes on. What Mr. Trump has had to wrestle with is that choice is theirs to make. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. Your authority is total. It's total. It's total. And the governors know that. What are you going to grant me what the Constitution gave me before you were born? It's called the Tenth Amendment. 
I didn't need the president of the United States to tell me that I'm governor. I think that states are much more weary of relying upon the federal government now, and they are they formed the western states in the west coast, in the northeast have formed their own consortiums that are going to make decisions together about when to reopen. And I think that they're, they've learned a lesson about relying on, on leadership from the White House and that they're going to largely try to do this on their own. And, and it doesn't really matter almost what Trump is going to say. The United States was challenged by a complex foe, undaunted by its borders and military might. It didn't mobilize a global response. Few expect that of anyone anymore. No amount of money or power protected America. Like so many other nations, it was flat-footed. What does seem distinct here, though, are the extremes of the spread, inequity and politics. Lives have been ruptured, but that trauma has also brought a unity of purpose. We've seen an abundance of courage, kindness and compassion. There was no single guiding light for the world to follow. Drastic, draconian action isn't easy in any democracy. This one won't ever be the same again. <laughs> 